The idea that you can cook or, or you can't cook is mistaken. It's just not that black and white. And even if you're confident in the kitchen, well, I mean, there are always more skills that you can add, right? If your home were a restaurant, how many cooks would you have to be just to get dinner done? <laughs> you're gonna be really proud of yourself today and all the other cooks that you've become on the Carefree Cooks Code. I'm Chef Todd Moore and this is the Carefree Cooks Code every Tuesday live at noon Eastern. Here's our challenge. How can home cooks cook freely with creativity, confidence, and pride while ignoring recipes and still impressing themselves and others with what they cook? Well, the answer is found in becoming empowered with how cooking works, using dependable and repeatable methods of cooking that work for any ingredient, for any diet, and any desire, just like chefs do. And we'll know we've cracked it when everyone sees cooking as an exciting and rewarding way to improve their relationships, their lifestyles, and their health through better food and cooking. This is the Carefree Cooks Code. Hey, welcome back to the Carefree Cooks Code, everyone. This is the free public weekly show for the methods, the techniques, the insights into better food and cooking. We're live every Tuesday at noon Eastern right here on my Chef Todd Moore page on Facebook. Again, it's an open class to the public, so you can share it with as many people as you like. And if you're a student in one of my paid courses, this is not part of the curriculum. Your courses are found on those websites as well. Uh, you can find every other course that you might be a, a member of under Web Cooking Classes, Sauce Boss, and so on and so forth. But if you want to get an email reminder of what I'm doing and when I'm going live, go to webcookingclasses.com slash live. And if you want to see what I'm cooking, a little bit of description about how I did it or just brag about how good it was, <laughs> um, go follow Chef Todd Moore on Instagram as well. This, I forgot. God, I didn't even post a Thanksgiving photo. I went looking through photos and I found this. This was smoked turkey, turkey gravy from the stock, herb de, de Provence roasted potatoes, nice herb mixture. But the thing was I got a turkey breast, took the breast meat off, used the carcass to make the stock, to make the gravy. It's one of those basic skills that really takes your, your food way over the top. And how do I do it? Well, I'm a carefree cook. I create my own recipes. I bring friends and family together. I learn every time I cook. I create my own cooking style because I practice pro methods and I wind up loving my cooking. Hey, look, if you think that becoming a carefree cook, cooking with dependable methods over written instructions, uh, being able to recognize the effects of heat on food instead of cooking by time and temperature, if you think that becoming a carefree cook sets you truly free in the kitchen, cooking with creativity, confidence, and pride, if you think it means that you've only become one carefree cook, you'd be wrong. You'd be way wrong. Because if you take that journey, you're becoming many carefree cooks without even realizing it. And I came to this realization a while ago when my favorite Baltimore restaurant announced that it would not be opening when the pandemic started. And I'm gonna tell you all about it today. But first, I've got a what am I for you. There it is. Uh, some pictures of food, it looks like. Um, it's an egg and something else. And Okay, so if you combine them in one way, you're going to get really bad scrambled eggs. <laughs> but if you know the method you can make, Tell me in the comment section below, what am I? All right, it's another Tuesday uh, that I love because I'm always glad when we're together again, we can move our journeys forward. We can take more steps. We can add more tools to the tool belt in the kitchen. And I really appreciate that you show up every Tuesday to learn something new. Learners are, are cool people. You're aware. You're awake. <laughs> you're, you're listening. You're accepting new information, new ideas, even if, they might contradict the things that you think you already know. Let me say that again, because that's important. Just because a new idea seems to contradict what you already know, that doesn't make the new idea wrong. Being curious, having an open mind, being joyful at a new discovery instead of combative that it's not what you already believe, that's a necessary part of your journey to becoming a carefree cook and a well-adjusted adult. 
<laughs> I might suggest. If you're not willing to learn something new, don't waste your time arguing with people that, that are telling you it's not worth it. Go, go ahead and do it anyway. But if you want new information, if you want to find a place somehow to move your journey forward, this is the place. You're in the right place today because I, I, I'm still doing it. I, I'm still learning every day. I got letters after my name, tons of experience. That doesn't matter to me. I'm not done learning. And like I've said often, I learn from you. I'm a lurker. <laughs> in my own group and I so appreciate that. Thank you for sharing your cooking ideas and your inspirations and I admit I've stolen a few of them, right? I've taken your ideas and I've used them in my own kitchen because that's why we're all here, right? To steal. No, 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 not, not to steal. To take the ideas and then put them to use the way that you want to do it because when you stuff all this knowledge into your kitchen apron pocket, you start to realize that your cooking is better than the restaurants used to be. Are you having that realization lately? Cooking your own food at home is better. It's cheaper. It's easier. It's safer. It's healthier. And you get the pride of doing it yourself. But you need a few skills to do that. And as a matter of fact, when you cook as well or as better than the restaurants that you used to go to, you're not just one carefree cook. You're many carefree cooks. And let me explain. Oh my goodness, I was so sad when one of my favorite restaurants in Baltimore, in the world for that matter, closed right at the onset of the pandemic. They're like, we're out. We know we're not going to recover. I mean, hot cuisine restaurants like this, they're having trouble to begin with. And when Heather and I were able to go out to restaurants, something we don't do anymore, uh, meaning I've cooked pretty much every single meal we've eaten for 23 months, I think, a hamburger here and there when we're on the road. But when, when we did go to restaurants, we went to nice restaurants, restaurants that I really like. And the Alexander Brown restaurant in beautiful downtown Baltimore, Maryland, was one of our favorites. It was barely open a year. It was hot cuisine, up, 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 top level, top of the top in restaurants. And Alexander Brown isn't just a big name in Baltimore, but in our entire nation. Because Alexander Brown and Sons, no, that's where I want to go. Alexander Brown and Sons was the first investment bank in the United States in 1808. And it was raising funds for Baltimore's water system and was the prime investor in the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad in 1827 that opened the, rest, the West. So I could go on for about an hour about the Irish immigrant and the prominent Baltimorean whose family changed our country for generations along with his sons, William, George, James, and John. But this is supposed to be about food and cooking. Anyway, the original bank was built in 1901 and it survived the Great Baltimore Fire of 1904 and it's still standing today, owned by the Brown family, but was renovated and opened as, like I said, a really hot cuisine restaurant. And oh my goodness, it was exquisite. When we used to eat there, portraits of the original land granted Lord of Baltimore, cool guy. I definitely would want to hang with him. Uh, along with some really impressive artwork, the old maps of the Inner Harbor, alongside paintings of horses, hounds, and uh, clipper ships. <laughs> if you see horses, hounds, and clipper ships on the wall, that means you're in a Baltimore restaurant for sure, hon. Uh, you feel like you're eating in 1901 when you're there. It's so cool. And I know you're going to ask what we used to order when I went there, so I'm going to have to tell you about it. And since I think it's bad form to take pictures of your food at a fancy restaurant, especially with the flash, I've never taken a photo of the food there. It's, just, it's tacky, I think. Uh, these photos are from their website. So I remember having a crab beignet appetizer. Uh, I, I teach beignets in web cooking classes, I think. A pat -a -shoe puff pastry with crab. Crazy. It was like a crab cloud. It was light. It was clean. It was freshly crabby. They served it with this green avocado creme fresh and scoops of Old Bay, of course. And I mean, <laughs> you, could, you could smell the Old Bay on this before, when the waiter was across the restaurant. The whole place just smelled of Old Bay seasoning. It was awesome. I love that. Um, I had their duck breast. Uh, it was served with black rice, 
in a really savory sauce, pickled daikon, grilled baby bok choy. Uh, I remember Heather used to get the um, king salmon, had this nice crispy skin on it, cooked on a flat top or something that none of us own. Oh, I do know a guy in Minnesota that owns a flat top that I'm jealous of. Nonetheless, uh, served with beluga lentils, summer squash in a romesco sauce with a tempura squash blossom. Tempura squash blossom really put it over the top. I mean, it was like eating in this restaurant was like eating one of the works of art off the wall. Not the hounds, <laughs> not the horses. And, you know, I don't know if I'll ever be in a restaurant like that again. And that's why I've been concentrating on improving my cooking skills during this pandemic. I still want that level of food. I just got to make it myself now. Minus the flat top. Yeah, um, you know, my cooking skills, I, I think after almost two years, even being a professional chef, they're better than the restaurants. And I hear from so many of you who aren't professional chefs that your cooking is better than the restaurants because most of the middling restaurants, they're hardly professional chefs that are cooking there anywhere. You can do better than they can. But what I wanted to know is how many chefs would it take to pull off that meal? The things that we used to love, cooking fish, cooking a duck breast, making a clean and crispy vegetable tempura, steaming vegetables, making black rice. Could one person possibly have all those skills to put that on a plate? Well, in your house, yeah. <laughs> it has to be, but at the Alexander Brown, no, oh, there's not just one guy back there cooking. What's this, Paris? You know, there's a whole staff of people. There is a whole team of people back there, and it's called the Kitchen Brigade. And it's something that we teach in culinary school, what the different positions in a classical kitchen are. And I remember sitting in that restaurant, in food heaven, <laughs> thinking about all the chefs and all the skills that go into making a spot on hot cuisine, high level meal like that. And even if it's not fancy hot cuisine, I'm thinking about how many chefs you'd have to be just to make dinner every night of the week. And that's when I started checking off all the skills in my head. Am I teaching these lessons? Am I teaching these skills? Could my students do that? Could they do this? Did I teach them how to do that? Did I show them adequately how to put that plate together? Did I then give them the confidence to do it? I want you to cook like Alexander Brown. Not him, himself. He's long dead. He's not cooking. <laughs> I want to know how many roles in the classical kitchen brigade system could you fill? Could I fill? Do you fill? Do, don't you fill? And today, I'm going to ask you the same question. How many roles can you fill? How many cooks do you have to be to get the meals done that you really love? And it all goes back to a little bit of culinary history. Because Auguste Scaffier is considered the father of, of modern cuisine. He created the brigade system. And maybe one day I'll do a culinary history episode in the future, but that's not today. So uh, before restaurants, large kitchens were in the household of a rich or very important person. And it was chaos. There's no commercial restaurant. There's just lords and nobles kind of thing or rich industrialists. And kitchen duties were organized by the type of food, not the skill or the task to be completed. So it's just like only the chicken cooker, only the, the so it, it went crazy. But Escoffier changed all this. Around 1885, he was at the Savoy Hotel in London. And Escoffier said that the chaos had to stop. And he created the same brigade system that we use today. The best place that you can see this, uh, maybe not now, but where it's used in modern days is on a cruise ship. If you've been on a cruise, you've seen that classical brigade system at work in the kitchen. There's also a dining room classical brigade as well. And maybe we'll touch on that in a future episode. So here it is. Here's Escoffier's classical brigade system. How many of these jobs could you do in the kitchen? And... Please forgive my French pronunciations. That's what it is. Okay, so first, the top of the kitchen is the chef de cuisine. He is the chief of the kitchen. That's most often called executive chef in the world today. It's really not a cooking position, as a matter of fact. It's a management position. 
Executive chef doesn't cook much, creates menus, purchases raw food, hires staffs, trains apprentices, manage the kitchen, manage food costs, things like that. Well, that's you, right? You, you, you are the chef de cuisine in your own kitchen if you're doing the planning and the shopping. Okay, so below him or her is the sous chef de cuisine or the under chief of the kitchen. This person carries out the orders of the chef de cuisine. They accept the incoming food. They often take inventory and track usage and report to the chef de cuisine for purchasing. They often run the kitchen because the chef de cuisine isn't really there during service times, unless it's a really busy or important service. So do you put away the groceries in your house? That makes you the chef de cuisine, congratulations. The saucier, is the sauce maker. And in smaller kitchens, they also make all the soups. Third in charge, this is one of the most respected positions in the kitchen because of the obvious skill that it takes to make all the sauces for the dish, all right? Saucier, high level skill. So you're the saucier in your kitchen, aren't you? You make the sauces. Okay, so that's three jobs now that you do in your kitchen. Let's keep going. The cuisinier is the line cook. They assemble the dishes under heat using the prepared ingredients set up for them. You are the cuisinier in your kitchen if you're assembling prepared ingredients and having them meet the heat. Wow, you're doing four jobs now, good for you. The commis is the junior cook. He ass assists the cuisinier. If you've got children who cook with you or a spouse, you can make them commis. Tell them they're comi. <laughs> then there are stations set up by the cooking method and not the food. This was the big change for Escoffier. Not the type of food, but the cooking method. Gee, I wonder where he got it from. Oh, wait a minute. No, no. <laughs> I cannot take credit for Escoffier. He said it first and I then brought it to you. That's the whole idea. This is where classical cuisine is. It's by methods. And that's where Escoffier agrees with me <laughs> or the other way around. Cooking methods are way more important than what you're cooking. And the rotisseur is the roast cook for large pieces of meat and whole birds over a spit. The griardin is the grill cook. The fruitier is the fry cook working with hot oil. The poissonier is the fish cook who prepares all the seafood dishes as well, as well as cleaning and portioning the whole fish, usually uses steaming methods. You'll see that. The entremetier is the entree preparer. They prepare soups also, do prep on vegetables. They do egg dishes when there isn't an undercook doing that job. And in the modern brigade, this is usually the expediter um, or the announcer who assembles the final plate and garnishes everything, wipes the rim, sends it out to the dining room, right? Otherwise, the entremetier oversees these positions. The potager makes all the soups, reports to the entremet, <laughs> uh, yeah, that guy. Uh, the legumiere is the vegetable cook, steaming, poaching vegetables, par cooking things for later vegetables. And it seems to me that you're probably all of those jobs in the kitchen too. So what's that? What are we up to? You're, you're about 10 Different cooks now? Well, then there's the grand manger, the pantry, uh, the pa uh, pantry supervisor, literally the food keeper. Grand manger, they are responsible for cold preparations also. Hors d'oeuvres, pâtés, terrines, aspics. Uh, you're probably not making too many aspics in your house. They often also though, oh, 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 wait, here it is. They make the leafy salads and the cold protein salads. They're responsible for buffet design. So have you ever made some tuna salad or chicken salad? Beautiful, you're the gourmet too. Um, are you using your knife skills to break down whole chickens into parts? Saving a whole bunch of money and creating free chicken. Your, your boning knife creates free chicken. Well, you're the boucher too, the butcher. And if you bake, you're probably doing five other jobs in the kitchen. The patissier is the pastry cook, prepares sweets and other baked goods. And sometimes the patissier also makes fresh pasta because the procedure to making fresh pasta is so similar to, to mixing and baking. The confiseur makes candies and pedophores. And at the Alex Brown restaurant, I remember, um, you got a mousse bouche. You know, don't you love that fancy restaurant? You get a little treat before you start the meal. This is compliments of the chef. It's a little treat to amuse your mouth. Mousse bouche. Uh, we were given, what Heather? Um, 
chocolates, I think. These really artful little chocolates with a hazelnut cream, uh, little jellied raspberry squares that we got with the final check too is cool. But it was the confiseur that made those things. So there you have it. You are, <laughs> as the nursery rhyme goes, you're the butcher, you're the baker, and you're the candlestick maker, right? And that's how it goes. You've heard my, my Chef Bandula story. I love Chef Bandula. Uh, one of my mentors, a uh, master pastry chef uh, that was uh, m my instructor when I went to Baltimore Culinary. And when I returned to teach, he was still there. And I got to teach with him a a as a uh, an associate. Um, but I remember you'd bring him the breads in baking class and he would say, you must be candlestick maker. <laughs> Which was a, with the pull. Anyway, uh, let's keep going. The glacier. Uh, prepares frozen and cold desserts, most often an ice cream maker. Um, again, like one of my favorite restaurants in the world, the Gilda restaurant in Barcelona, Spain. My friend, Michel Bierve, he has an ice cream chef on staff. Michel is a little insane, okay? He is a culinary savant, and uh, he's the guy that pairs fried shrimp with basil ice cream. Yeah, it's crazy. If you have my Spanish Food Finds DVD and online class, you can see the interview with him and the incredible dishes that he makes with his ice cream chef, a Belgian ice cream chef or glacier. The, de the decorator uh, creates showpieces, is there for specialty cakes and events. They may also make filigree, uh, little chocolate pieces, uh, a savory filigree that go on top of the mashed potatoes. They garnish the cakes and desserts. The boulanger is the baker, often splitting responsibilities with the patissier between sweet baked goods and breads and rolls. And don't forget about two other very important positions in the kitchen that maybe you still are or your spouse still is. The plongeur, plunging <laughs> into water. The plongeur is the dishwasher. That's you too. And in a larger kitchen, there's the mormeton. And that's the heavy pot washer. That's probably your job too. So were you keeping score? <laughs> was, that, was that fun watching me try and uh, <clears throat> muddle through uh, all those French words? There are 21 classical brigade jobs you are doing in your own kitchen. You are 21 chefs. Congratulations. Good for you. You're doing the work of 21 people just to get the food on the table. But you still love it. Don't you? Don't you love it? Well, now you can be even more proud of what you're creating because you're also developing a very specialized skill set. You don't just cook. You create. You invent. You improvise. You do what 21 other people would be doing if they were there with you. If you were working on a cruise ship or at the Alexander Brown restaurant in Baltimore, which doesn't exist anymore. But they're not. There's not 21 people in your kitchen. It's just you. And I cringe every time somebody tells me that they can't cook because these are the people that believe you're just born knowing how to cook or not. But it's not a gene. There's no cooking gene. It's just a combination of skills, one at a time. The simple ones, you master them. The intermediate ones, the higher level ones. It's like we talked about earlier. At the beginning of this program today, if you're open to learning, then you can own all of those skills. And that's why having a sense of forward motion, having a sense of progressing in any journey is important, but especially so in becoming a carefree cook. Because each new skill that you add to your repertoire, the greater variety of meals you can make and the less chefs from the 1800s, you have to hire. <laughs> it might be hard to, to find some of these guys anymore, right? So look, you don't need to hire chefs from the 1800s. <laughs> you, you can be all the positions in your own home restaurant. And you know what this is good for? You never have to solve labor dispu disputes. Um, you'll probably never go on strike. Uh, you won't ask yourself for a raise. And all the votes in the kitchen will be unanimous. <laughs> so that's good. Hey, did you notice what's not on that list? There's no Instapot Crecure. 
<laughs> There's no sous vide sous chef, right? And I'm not going to get started about gadgets today because Escoffier, he wouldn't like it. He never saw a sous vide stick in his life. <laughs> so I'm telling you, stay home, be safe, cook your own food in your own kitchen and see how many chefs you can become. And I'm having fun checking off the number of restaurants that I've replaced in my own house lately because I make better pizzas now than all the pizza places I've ever been to. Uh, I'm making better Indian food than my Indian restaurant and I'm baking my own naan now. Uh, my fried rice is cleaner, it's lighter, it's so much less salty <laughs> than the stuff I used to buy. And here, showing some awesome heat control with a nice piece of mahi-mahi that's toasted. Uh, I've replaced my Mexican restaurant. I'm even making items that weren't even on the menu in my Mexican restaurant. I'm making tostadas, this with avocados, tomatoes, black beans. I'm even making my own sushi now, something I hadn't done in 15 years, maybe. You remember that duck breast that I showed you from the Alexander Brown restaurant, the restaurant that no longer exists? I'm sad about it, but it's not stopping me from having Brussels sprouts with a perfectly cooked duck breast and a raspberry sauce. And it's all because of dependable and repeatable cooking methods. I have the confidence to cook those special meals, those birthday meals, anniversary meals, holiday meals, or just because I feel like having lobster on a Thursday. I'm confident I can buy more expensive ingredients because I know that I can cook it correctly. And don't forget that you can see <laughs> all those restaurants, all that food that I'm replacing on my Instagram page. See what I'm cooking. See how I'm trying my own culinary journey. And if you're dedicated to learning, if you're dedicated to progressing, then this exploration is one of the most exciting things that you can do with your time. It's so much fun. It's so rewarding to me. Okay, what am I? Am I really oily scrambled egg yolk? Probably not. I'm hollandaise sauce. <laughs> and it's another skill that you should have, making hollandaise sauce. Not just for eggs, Benedict, but for vegetables, for fish, fish with hollandaise, asparagus with hollandaise. That's the saucier's job. Become the saucier. <laughs> hey, if you enjoyed everything that you learned today about classical brigade system, and if you have greater sense of pride in your cooking now, because you know you're doing the work of 21 chefs, if you realize also though, that there's still so much to learn, please like, love, share this video so even more people can become as free as we are in the kitchen. And um, psst, I got something to tell you that I haven't told anybody else yet. Uh, it's time for another Saturday casual cooking event coming up this Saturday at noon Eastern. It'll be right here on my public Chef Todd Moore Facebook page. I haven't posted a link or anything yet, so come back here often Probably Friday would be the best time to look for the link. It's winter time. We're all inside a bit more. So I thought I'd try another Saturday co uh, casual cooking class. Um, haven't decided what we'll do yet, but everybody has told me how much they love these casual cook along things for the public. So I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of people there. So we'll see you on Saturday. Until next Tuesday, when we try to figure out another key to cracking the Carefree Cooks Code, this is Chef Todd Moore reminding you that there's a method to your classical cooking success. <laughs>